Yeah. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Chris Denson. Chris is the host of the Innovation Crush podcast. He is an innovator, marketer, and recovering comedian. He's the author of the Amazon number one best-selling book, Crushing the Box, 10 Essential Rules for Breaking Essential Rules. Welcome, Chris. That was just as good as you rehearsed it. So, <laughs> almost better. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you for having me, Pete. I always ch I try to check my bios with my guests. <laughs> Chris, all right, here we go. If you weren't working in marketing, ah. media, product innovation, or comedy, what would you be doing? I think I'd be a forensics detective. <laughs> like, um, what's the big show? NCIS or like what? I don't know. Yeah, one of those. SUV. Yeah, I'd be Ice T. Is basically what, <laughs> what I'd be. <laughs> Um, I've always, like, yeah, I, I kind of sometimes have a, a subtle pride about myself and the way I can figure certain things out. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, he must have taken his shoes off when he, before he came in the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think it's just part of being an observer, you okay. know, I think as an observer of culture, you're kind of keened on picking up where, you know, the clues that most people don't see. So, um, but I, I do get a little obsessed over that kind of that's thing. That's a, that's the first. Yes. I have not had that, that response. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about that. So, you know, there was a time when I was in my 20s that I was like, I thought I was going to be an FBI agent and because of Silence of the Lambs. Just because of Silence? <laughs> well, you know, I get sort of planted a seed that probably wouldn't have been planted. Right. I think. Um, but you're, you're coming at this like you want to become a forensics ex expert, not because the romanticizing the job because of media, but because you like paying attention. I think so. Yeah. I like I'm figuring it out. Right? Yeah. I think, I think, I guess we're all sort of creative problem solvers. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the, no, the, no, 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 no. We're not all creative problem solvers. Of, of course we are. I mean, every day, like if you're just trying to figure out, Oh, we got to get the kids to school sure. and go to the grocery store and get ready for vacation. You have a very creative problem to solve. Right. Uh -huh. And it requires some, like there's always some level of ingenuity required to achieve a goal in the moment or to evolve past the circumstances. That's where like really even where I base my innovation work and okay. that thesis that we're all looking to evolve in some way, shape, or form. Some of it is like whether you're the CEO of GE or you're a single parent just trying to figure out a different way of communicating with your kids, right? It takes some level of retooling. All right. That's all right, I half agree with you. Okay. So I, I agree that we're all problem solvers. Yes. For people to be a creative problem solver, they should be seeking a novel solution. And so now, according to my definition yeah, of creativity, yeah. right? Yeah. So we, we might have different definitions, yep. right? So my definition is creativity is arriving at an appropriate and original solution to a problem, right? Right. So that is the solution actually solves the problem. You get your kids to school mm -hmm. and then, um, original is that other people aren't doing it the same way, right? right. That's where the advantage lies. Or is it, today. or so, like, is it, cause sometimes it's relative, right? Like sometimes it's my, the creativity within my circle of whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish it might not be the same as, I don't know, Murakami, right? Like, but it, but for me, like if you uh, proportionally, it could be the same level <laughs> of, of just reimagining whatever the circumstance is. Okay. I don't know. No, well, you do know because you are the <laughs> Amazon number one best-selling book author, Crushing the Box, 10 Essential Rules for Breaking the Essential Rules, right? Yes. That's about creativity, right? Because yeah, yeah. You're, you're looking. You're, you're about finding novel things. Before we get into that, sure. I was sure you were going to answer that you were going to be a packaging engineer. Mm. What, yes. I wasn't even sure I was going to be a packaging engineer. <laughs> because so, so. you, have, you have an engineering degree. I do. In yeah. packaging. Yeah. So I don't think people, most people, A, really understand what a big deal packaging is. Yep. 
And, and then certainly they don't know that you can go to college to learn to be in that type of engineer. So can you talk a little bit about, yeah, about it, that? Because I mean, the fact that you're doing what you're doing is you've come along. Yeah. I've had many lives. Yes. Many lives. But, I, you know, I, again, I think there's some commonalities, right? But um, as far as the degree itself, I went to Michigan State University. Go Spartans. <laughs> is one of a, few, a handful of schools in the country, if not the world, that offer a degree such as this. So packaging engineering, everything you see comes in some sort of package. Whereas the shoes you buy or the transmission that goes into your vehicle, it is packed and shipped to some place. Right. And so I actually worked at Chrysler. That's why I mentioned the trans, the transmission example. And I worked for transmission plant and engine plant. And, you know, one of them, we had 170 parts coming in from all over the country and a couple places, uh, internationally. Same thing with another one. It was like 300 parts. So uh, my favorite example of this is there's a, in most transmissions, there's a, a plate called a transfer plate where the transmission fluid goes through. Right. Okay. And, and they're varying size, probably like two dozen different size holes in your transfer plate. Um, some of them are just pin sized. And if a speck of dust gets inside that pin sized, uh, hole, it could shut down your entire transmission. Okay. So, so why don't they make the holes bigger? I, I'm, I'm not an automotive <laughs> engineer. I'm just, I'm only the guy that puts it in the box. So, and crushing the box. So anyway, no. So it, wait, hold on. Can, for as an aside, the yes. crushing the box is that just coincidence? It is now. Yeah. Okay. There was yeah. There was no. 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 But I'm saying like you were a packaging engineer. You cared a lot about boxes. Now you care about the sort of metaphorical thinking outside the box. When you name this crushing the box, did it have two meanings? No, no, not it had nothing to do with corrugated board. Okay, that's bro. fine. I just, I mean, I. A yeah. lot of people did think it was a double a euphemism for relations, and I was like, no one says that. No one says crushing the box. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I was like, I was like, who? Well, the first time it came up, and it was already after we had like yeah, the, the yeah. book was coming out, and I was like, really, people say that? But no, so I mean, look, it, when I was, uh, I don't me, think people say that. <laughs> I don't. I, I, agree I don't with think you. people say that. No. I agree with you too. Okay, we we'll have to start taking a survey. It's cr- they Adam say Cole they say crushing ass or that. Well, LL Cool J <laughs> had a song. That's the only thing I could think of. Like in the nineties, it was and it was it was really bad. It was pink cookies in a plastic bag getting crushed by buildings, and it, that was his meta. I was like, that's a little far. Wow, but that's the closest I can get to crushing any kind of. Yeah, box. yeah, okay. We are now where we've really. Wow, <laughs> it's still related because the box, the corrugated boxes, do have to be placed elsewhere. But I mean, <laughs> for me, you know, you're a 17 year old kid, and you're about to go into college, and they're like, "What do you want to do for the rest of your life?" And I wasn't one of those kids that knew exactly. I'm going to do this, mm-hmm. so I picked something that didn't involve too much science. Uh, you know, it was, it was like a lot of physics. Tensile strength, plastics, corrugated mm-hmm. boards, stacking strength, like things like that. Where, but it wasn't like electrical engineering where I needed to know circuits and formulas and so on and so forth. So a lot of it was just similar to what we were talking about is logistical and creative problem solving. So I may know how many of those transfer plates I can get on one tray, how big that tray is when it goes on the assembly line, and how many I need to ship in order to you know fulfill the number of cars that are being. B- produced every day. I see. So X it, times Y times exactly. Z. Exactly. Yeah. Um, really important role because then you had like for whether you go into the pharmaceutical side of it or fashion, like e- again, everything comes in some sort and it has to maintain its integrity from where it, wherever the materials are sourced to the time it gets to the consumer. So, but I hated it. So, <laughs> uh, and I did that for a couple of years and then, um, I made a move. So yes. and you made the move to LA to LA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Left good old Auburn Hills. Uh, Michigan and um but I, at the time I'd been doing stand up comedy like from the time I was also a freshman at school okay and um I did that for a good 7 years won a ton, ton of competitions hosted a bunch of things on campus did it for a little while while I was out here in LA and then um is that what brought you to LA the the comedy yeah pretty much okay I was I was what really brought me here was this idea that I wanted to write so, I, you know, uh, had a friend of mine in school and we created a sketch comedy show and it did really well, like locally. Like, not only was it on the college campus channel, it was like in East Lansing. Okay. Um, we we're like, this is great. And so I really just love it. Like, this is so easy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's easy when you, when you love it, right? And yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. Like, 
if I go back and look at the just something as simple as the formatting of the script, it was like I wrote it like you know when you read Shakespeare in high school, it was like person colon yeah <laughs> you know, right dialogue and then enters Joe so. But it, again, it's just like the love and the passion, and I felt like I was pretty decent at it, mm-hmm. and so I, I took the risk. I, you know, I have one friend who lived here. I go, all right, well, let's. I came to visit him for a week, okay, and then just kind of got like got the lay of the land. And three months later, you know, you're I, on your I way. Packed up my Suzu Rodeo, which is ironic because I was leaving Chrysler in an Isuzu Rodeo. Yeah, which is, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, it's like. It's funny, Isuzu Rodeo, on one hand, is like the most Japanese name you can have, and then coupled with the most American name yes. that you can have for a car. Until they became Daimler Chrysler. Then it was that, yes, German. And we had like all like three <laughs> continents covered at that point though. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, so you and you call so you call yourself a recovering comedian. Are you is that is that just because it's catchy, or do you really feel like you're a recovering comedian in the way that someone might be a recovering alcoholic or something where there's some struggle or there's some pain or that there's some legacy. Yeah, more in the sense that I think there's remnants left over, right? I I still like being silly. I I don't get up in front of an audience and do a set, but I do infuse humor into a lot of things I do, you know, or at least the mechanics of humor. Right? Mm-hmm. Like drawing parallels between things that don't normally get drawn together, um, or even the craft of coming up with an idea and pitching it to an audience, whether it's five people, you know, sitting in a boardroom or you're in front of a giving a talk, like you're giving somebody your concept, your perspective, your, and it's, it's yours and yours alone at a, at a point in time. So, and then even with innovation crush, I like to say it's a cross between you know, the daily show and fast company. So. Yeah, I mean, this is something I really like about you. So, I don't, ha- it's not a test. Trust me, it's not a test. There's like an elevator experience when I do these podcasts, when I'm on the road. Right. right? So, oftentimes I'm in the elevator with my guest. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting if the guest it makes jokes or not in yeah. the elevator. Now, you made jokes. So, I saw you, you made two, three jokes even before we From sat the man down. Who studied humor. Look at you. <laughs> Count, you counted my jokes. That's great. <laughs> You, you you made at least three jokes, I think, right? And so you're going, I, you're looking, I can see you looking inward. You're like, which was the jokes? Uh, you know. There was a clothing joke. There was a joke about the, the food. And yes. there was at least one other one. In any case, it's funny because sometimes I'm, I'm like with very established comedians. Mm-hmm. There's no jokes. You yep. know, like, so I had Willie Anderson on the program. Oh, wow. And we, we talked and he he sort of said like the funnier he gets on stage, the less funny he is in his own life. And I I feel like I'm I, almost you're the opposite. opposite. Like I'm like spontaneity. I'm pretty good. Like when I start writing, I, I've been writing material for maybe the last six months. Mm-hmm. But there's something about the spontaneity of the humor I like uh-huh. that I resonate well with. You know, and most of the stand up I write. Not that I performed it, but the most of the stuff that I write is kind of like, it's because I said it in a moment and I try to capture that moment. I see. Right? I don't sit down and go like, all right, well, what happens at the grocery store? Like, I may say something while I'm in the grocery store, like, that's funny. I should remember that. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of comedians have that process, but I, I think it's just I, my starting, my entry point isn't trying to figure out what's going to be funny, but just like capturing something that actually is. I see. So when you, do you write funny? Like when, you know, when you're working on this book, Mm -hmm. how much, first of all, how funny are you trying to make the book? Do you feel pressure to? Yeah. I felt, I mean, I felt like my duty was to sound like I sound, right? And I kind of bought, like I have a cadence of humor, humor, serious, Mm -hmm. serious, right? Like it's, and, you know, I hope, at least from my experience, even with Innovation Crush, is that it, it, kind of warms the reader to you know it's not hard uh statistics there's no pie charts there's you know you don't have to read it in succession right i'm a lazy reader it's not myself. a lecture right. i feel exactly. like a lecture i didn't want it to feel that way and that's why i was going back and forth with my, my publisher for a while on just that right that piece of it and i tried to set the reader up for it. so the first the introduction uh chapter is actually just about my experience 
in, in comedy and comparing it to innovation. I see. And so that way, no matter what I say, you know, coming up, I mean, I made cocaine references in the book. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of random Chris Denson humor. But I think, it's, you know, again, that's the way I am, whether I'm in a brainstorm with a client or wherever I am, there's this mix of haha, but like, okay, well, no, serious. And I think in a, in a lot of ways, the humor, if you're in a, especially in brainstorming, being able to make a pun or parallel or a rhyme or some suddenly you've drawn these two concepts together. You're like, Oh, actually that could work. And yes. then you start to, there's actually a drill that I love in the brainstorm process, which is you have a, like a two minute sprint to write down all the worst ideas yes. possible. Yes. And then you, you pass the paper down to whoever your, your neighbor is. And then you have to make one of those ideas. Great. Yes. That's great. Right. So it's, it it does a, so many different things. It kind of democratizes the room. Like there's all because I think most times when we enter, sorry, I'm rambling, but a lot of times when we enter a brainstorm, especially like if you're at a job, like I, you know, I, I ran innovation for Omnicom Media Group for a while, and we get into these rooms, and you could tell people were nervous because they felt like they had to come in with an answer. They yeah. could, they were coming in, you know, to show up as a hero, and not deliberately. It's just I think it's just a subconscious thing we do. As opposed to brainstorm, which is just throw some shit on the wall and let's start to see what works. Mm -hmm. And so you do an exercise like that, it kind of like shakes the sillies out, right? And then, you know, you're on to off, off to the races. You know, it's not it's, the racists. <laughs> the racists. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, it's, it's so interesting that you bring this up because I've been writing about this because I've been writing about reversals mm. and, and that brainstorm the worst idea. Is a form of reversal, which right. is also has, is a, a comedic tactic mm. in a sense, and um, I think you're right. Like it, it's sort of fun. It takes the pressure off, and you certainly get ideas that you wouldn't have got absolutely got had through the through the normal process. So, how tell me a little bit about the um, this transition? So you came out here. You're sleeping on your friend's couch. You're doing comedy. You're living, you know, the L.A. lifestyle. You're a young man. And, um, but now you're a recovered comedian, right? So at some point you decided, so tell me how does it, how did this happen? It was, I think it was a mix of pursuing what I'm passionate about mm -hmm. and also wanting to eat. Okay. Cause, <laughs> cause I think, you know, I, I did stand up both noble causes. Exactly. <laughs> and I th so what happened for me is like, I got, you know, I got my first writing job eight months after I moved here and worked uh, on a show at BT and then. Continued to get other writing jobs after that. But I remember after a year, we got, um, we were get, going in the office to pick up our checks and there was a letter stapled to the outside of the envelope. And it was basically like, come Monday, the writing staff will no longer be needed on this show. Whoa. And for like a kid from the Midwest, I'm like, wait, you can just fire people like that? Like <laughs> a day's, no like literally, like you had the weekend. With a letter. Yeah, with a letter. Like nobody came in and said, hey guys, you know, we need to cut some budgets. Right. Here's what might happen. Like there was none of that. And for, that was a bit of culture shock for me because right. it was like coming from a Chrysler where you're going to get it? a notice. And, and there's unions you know, and, right, and so on. Right, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And I wasn't quite in the writer's guild yet. And so lesson learned for me and i was just like in between my entertainment gigs i would just pick up other things mm -hmm. so like i worked for the magic com conference in las vegas which is one of the largest fashion conferences in the world and i would go there twice a year mm -hmm. i would work on music videos mm -hmm. i would pick up a marketing pro like just kind of like whatever i could get my hands on just kind of hustling and then it wasn't until like years later in hindsight where i started to see what the thread was so when in the sense of like truly recovering comedian it was just sort of this gradual graduation from it mm -hmm. because of, again, wanted to eat and kind yeah. of going back and forth between those roots and, and like, uh, paying my rent. Even when I speak at schools now, like, I, I, when people go like, Oh, what's the best piece of advice you have for somebody just starting out? I was like, be smart with your money. You know, you don't want to do something just because you have to. Yeah. Even though, like, it, again, it, it was a long, frustrating journey for me. Like, oh, I wish I could. But, you know, you want to be able to buy yourself a cushion in case you get that letter stapled to your check, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I know, I know, I've known comedians here who have gone, who went from like, this is pre Uber, like went from having a nice car, fancy car, to riding the bus back to the fancy car. Yeah. You know, because it's, fortunes rise and fall based upon one show, yeah. two shows, 
and, and, the ga- and a five year gap in between. And I think the same thing happens, like, you know, because I, I play a lot in the business world. I think the same thing happens. Like, if you look at the startup ecosystems now, you know, it, that's like, it was, as Stephen Colbert, I think, when he interviewed the guys who started Air, it was Airbnb. I forget which one it was. But he said, is that the thing to do now in, in college? You just start a company? You know, it used to be you start a band. Now you start yeah. a company, right? And it's the same thing. It's like these serial entrepreneurs, like, get a ton of money, whether it's from investment or they actually sell their <laughs> their services and products. And then that company goes away. And you're like, what happened to, what's it called? There was a really good article in Mashable uh, d- during the holidays. Like, here's all the companies we lost this year. And you're like, uh, man, that is that is true. Like, you, you totally forget. Like, what are those people doing? I have a saying from my MBA class, business is hard. Business is hard. Business is hard. And, and I know it annoys my students when I say it because yeah. they, you know, if, when you get an MBA, it's all optimism. You read these cases. It's all success stories. Yeah. It's very rare to read a case about a failed company. And yet the norm is not if they'll fail, but when they'll fail. Absolutely. I mean... You know, and to what degree? Like, you know, yes, like, that's is, right. Is it a, you know, is it, it a Sears failure or is it like a, a PR nightmare? Like, there's various varying levels of, of failure. Yeah, and even and you know, even wildly successful companies, it's still crazy hard. Yeah. Look, Wells Fargo was a client of mine when I was at at uh, OMD, and this is at the time when all the shit hit the fan for them. For the sales stuff. Yeah. Like yes. the, if, you, if your audience remembers, like they've signed up millions of people with like false right. uh, accounts that they didn't sign up for. And then just as, you know, we're recovering from that, the second wind comes of, you know, taking advantage of people who don't speak English and you're like, Oh, I missed wow. that one. Yeah, yeah. So it's just <laughs> like, but the bank's still around, right? Yes. Like there, it's, it's a huge failure and it's bank money. Sure. We can argue that, but it's just this idea that. You're going to have like this accordion effect throughout whatever journey you're on. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a, sorry, just because uh, uh, when you talk about uh, like I'm a big fan of anti case studies. Um, yes, I gave a talk uh, last year in London, and it was a VR conference. And uh, I show everybody's like, "Here's our greatest VR thing we accomplished." I show one project that I'd done in VR, and the rest was about I think I had ten additional slides of just ideas that had been pitched. And why they never happened. Oh, that's fun. And so it was whether the tech couldn't do what we wanted it to do, the client didn't understand, like just whatever, you know, nuances pop up. Because again, like like your students, you're bright eyed and bushy tailed, but there's a re not that you shouldn't be, but there's a reality that comes along with it. You're not gonna be batting a thousand. That's right. I mean, I'm I don't say business is hard three times to try to convince them not to go into business. I what I I say it to convince them how much harder and more creative they need to be. Right. That this is, you don't just show up and great things happen. The example I have is Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, people consider it one of the best business books ever. What's funny is if you read the companies, if you read the case studies in that book, they're all failed companies now. So these were the these were the great companies that he was shining a light on saying, look what great best practices these folks have. And they're all now mediocre at best. Right. right? So like clearly this is hard. If these are, these are the best run companies. Right. At, at, at Good moment. to great to gone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like the <dude>, updated <laughs> text. <laughs> it's just empty pages. I should, uh, <laughs> I should write that follow up because I'm not as big a fan, <laughs> big a fan of that book. Okay. So you find yourself. So you're, you're chasing a paycheck for a good, good reason. Mm -hmm. And then the jobs that you're taking and the jobs that you're, I assume, excelling at are these kinds of innovation, marketing, media style jobs, related jobs. So I think the thread, right? Again, this is uh, in hindsight, but the need to like, I don't know whether you want to call it competitive or find out, find ways to cut through the clutter. If you're a performer, you and I both might have jokes about dating, right? Mm-hmm. But the w- I'm going to try to figure out a way to tell that dating joke or story or talk about dating in a way that nobody else has. Indeed, you know, it's uh, every like every writing book tells you: boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. Like every romantic comedy kind of mm-hmm. follows that formula. But there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of romantic comedies made, right? Mm-hmm. It's all sort of the same cadence. Yes, and I think ingenuity means you go. 
all right, how can I do this differently than anyone else has ever done it? Mm-hmm. And what? And so then you start to look at like, well, what else is out there that I should be thinking about incorporating mm-hmm. into this? So you start to connect dots in ways that, you know, hopefully, if if you're truly being uh, innovative, that no one else has, has done before. Mm-hmm. So that might be in storytelling, you know, I might like, oh, no one has set up a joke this way. Mm-hmm. Or it might be, you know, Amazon Alexa. Like voice could be a thing. What if we combine shopping with voice with so, like, so right. is that asking what if and finding a different way to cut through the clutter and then you start to like solve those business problems like sustainability and, and how do we maintain this and now what's our next iteration and how do we not alienate this audience and gain a new one? Like there's a whole, so many other iterative things that come after you find out what that core is. So whether I was working on a marketing project, it was like, okay, like a perfect example for a period of time, I worked at uh, Playboy. Didn't make any porn, just to let everybody know. <laughs> we, it was a, they were launching a hip hop network and it was meant to be a competitive, like a free thinking hip hop network. The worst show we did was a show called Queen of Clubs, which was like an American Idol of exotic dancers. <laughs> so, um, but with that one, it was, and that was the worst show you did. Right. Worse than me, and like societally worse. Not like, not quality entertainment. That was, that was, that was, that was a good pre production days. So, but it was, so we built this network from scratch. We had a logo and a name. Okay. And so we had to go like, what is it? What's the other programming that's out there? What can we introduce? Then how do we introduce it? Right. So mm-hmm. there's, it's these layers of communications. Build this, you know, a set of stories. Figure out, you know, what's missing in the marketplace. Extend an invitation of some sort through yes. marketing and media, and then continue to build from there. So, and this is it. It's the same thing. And then, plus, if you're, you know, it's a new company, you wanted to stay on top, Indeed. which you didn't. But you know, it's just that that exercise of of constantly trying to uh, leapfrog yourself. I see. And so, these ten essential rules are these rules that you've kind of learned over the years. Yes, doing this work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, it's funny because I mean, I always uh, I think habitually um, or by habit, I guess I uh, I've always been looking for a different answer, right? If, if that makes sense to that creative problem. Yeah, that, that's to me a different <laughs> answer is a cre- is cre- is a, a creative solution, right? So it. I remember I was uh, on a panel at Disney, and people were the question from the audience was. How do you know your project is successful? And most everybody on the, else on the panel is like metrics and data, and mm-hmm. which were absolutely correct <laughs> answers. You're like, and, am I sleeping well at night? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's almost. I said, I said it's all good and well. I said, I said we can't forget that we are human beings, right? So me talking to my client, I know when my client's happy or sleeping well at night. Yes, there are things that I thought like blew the roof off the industry, and they were like, nah. Mm-hmm. Right. And there are other things that kind of performed okay, but they just really loved it. And so they want to build on that from there. So, so I take the same approach with the book. Like the first chapter is about empathy, right? Which you don't, I, I, I think most people don't readily expect when they read a book that's rooted in some form of business. I, I, I certainly, and they certainly don't expect you to lead with that. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about this concept of micro failures. We were talking about failures earlier, Mm -hmm. but that chapter is called death by a thousand slaps, right? Like one slap. All right. You got me. You Uh know, a thousand in succession could really make your day really bad. Uh So so it's this idea that, you know, as we're trying to accomplish and achieve these things, there's all these little annoyances that pop up that just keep adding and wearing and, and diminishing your creative spirit. Okay. You know, whether it's that. 10th promising investor meeting that you had and nobody followed up yes. with or your kids messing up at school or what it, like the number of different things that aren't like you didn't lose a hundred million dollars and had to move back into your parents house it mm-hmm. was ah like it just these annoyances right that we all sort of experience on a on a day-to-day basis i see so you know how do you get through that and those are things those are things we can't ignore i've seen people have bad days and like it is a really bad domino effect that comes from that right so and that's kind of the direction then there's of course like the things you might expect like how do you build a team designed around innovation and you know what are some of those other tools and principles that should be incorporated into the process so which of the which of the this is a two-part question the answer might be the same do you like the most like if if I only allowed you to write that book one essential rule, mm-hmm. what would it be? And then 
which one do you find most personally useful? Like in your personal life, not yeah. in your professional life. Empathy comes up. That's how you asked me to pick my children. Um, <laughs> which, which one's the best? It's like a Sophie's choice, I understand. Because <laughs> exactly. uh, I'm guessing... Or the good it, I'm guessing this called. started out as like 14 and you cut it down to 10. Well, technically there's 11 because there's a bonus. <laughs> right? Which is, so, um, uh, spoiler alert. No, I, I mean, I, I think everything. I think that was the one that sort of just resonated with me the most. It was kind of rooted in an interview I'd done with this guy named Dan Goods, who's NASA's visual strategist. Okay. Or, or AKA their artist in residence. And Sounds like a there. pretty choice job. Oh my gosh. He's like, he's been there for 16, 17 years helping craft missions, do like turning science concepts into public art experiences. Mm -hmm. And during our conversation, I'm like, you realize you're basically market, you're like, you're NASA's marketing. Yeah. Right? He's a PR guy. And, uh, but it, you know, it's like, if I'm some engineer, a space engineer, I don't know what they call themselves, but I think they call them rocket. The way, the I think they call them rocket scientists. Or that, they? yes. <laughs> when I was walking around, uh, we got the tour of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and I was being deliberately annoying and everything. I pointed out, I kept calling it a space version of what it was. I'm like, oh look, space stairs. Oh look, a space garbage can. And they were like, okay, are you done, sir? But the first three times, it's pretty. That's pretty solid comedy. The tenth time is just funny to me. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's, what, well, that's the, when it got good. There is a rule in comedy, right? About if you do it a thousand times, it becomes funny again. Yes, it's like already becomes. If you do it a hundred times, it becomes funny again. I introduced my daughter to Andy Kaufman singing Mighty Mouse. Yes, that's a, that's a perfect example. Of funny it. the first time, you're like, is he still? Go is he going to keep doing this? Yeah, he's going to keep doing this. That's hilarious that he kept doing this, yeah. right? Like it's 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 that. But so Dan had an assignment when he was in um, art school and his professor was like, hey, draw me a picture of an otter, which he did. And um, he turned it in. The professor goes, all right, meet me at the pool tomorrow. And Dan shows up at the pool the next day and his uh, professor shows him a video of an otter swimming. And he says, now get in the water and swim like one. Okay. And he learned this deepened sense of empathy. And I think most of us as creators – we can look at things from afar and like observe, yeah, and, yeah. but it's another thing when you go there and you do it and you like get as knee deep as possible in whatever that area of culture is that you're trying to affect and change. Some of it we do it like, Hey, I've, I've worked in NASCAR all my life. I spotted a solution, but some of us are like, Oh, it'd be cool if NASCAR did this. But what if I went down to the NASCAR track and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, there's debris flying around here. Mm -hmm. I can't even breathe. Oh, it takes me an hour and a half to get a beer. Like it's, now you're solving empathetically for pain points and your best ingenuity and innovation is, is going to come from that core approach. And I think by training that sense of empathy, it extends into how you relate with your teams, your clients, your partners. You're, you're always kind of exhibiting this deepened sense mm -hmm. of connection. And so I think that kind of resonates with the rest of the book or at least the rest of, of what I learned. As far as like a harder principle, I think the idea of experimentation, I think mm -hmm. that's where, you know, a lot of companies, organizations, individuals fall short. Oh, yeah. Just being like being able to to allot some resource, time, a person, a team, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, as just to like explore. Mm -hmm. You know, because it it doesn't have KPIs, right? It does, yes, does, it doesn't have the hard business, you know, um, uh, return. But when it works, it really works. And I cite some examples of people who've done it, like the head of innovation at Adidas, no KPIs. The head of innovation at L'Oreal, their connected beauty incubator, you know, won won the CES Innovation Award a few years ago for connected soccer ball. It wasn't L'Oreal; that was the that was the Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> and the other was launched the first augmented reality makeup app. It was Makeup Genius, and I see. they got like fourteen million downloads in the first three months. And again, they. They weren't held to some really hard deliverable. It was like, let's see what's out there. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly, you know, you could look to like the big package good companies as being very regimented in the way right. they go about doing things and new and improved. Yes, that's right. And so you, and, <laughs> and you do get innovation, but they're just incremental kinds right. of things. Yeah, I think it's very difficult for, for companies to experiment. I mean, they're becoming better about it because yeah. they're starting to learn the benefits of it. It's funny because some of it is, the way I see it, some of it is, well, if you experiment, then you have to acknowledge that you were wrong. 
And that's hard to do oftentimes in organizations. Yeah. It's very threatening. You know, yeah. these are people who often are very risk averse. The other one is, and I don't think a lot of people understand this, is these companies, so many of them are just scrambling to just get their normal stuff done in a reasonably decent way without going completely over budget or right. over deadline or whatever it is. And this idea of experimentation is feels luxurious. Yeah. You know, I mean, as an academic, I do experimentation all the time, but I live in a world of mostly soft deadlines if there is a deadline. Right. You know, there's pressure to get to produce, but you you produce things when it's ready, right. not by end of Q4, right, in that way. I think, I think once you – and part of it, you know, the storytelling is – I mean, it's the whole reason I even started Innovation Crush, right, is I had – been going and chatting with companies. I'd left the was working at Machinima for a while. I left Machinima to and for almost a year I was just having meetings and I was talking to people and I go like I was talking to them about innovation. And most times I did, just, just didn't know what to do with it. Right. Oh, so you're a creative director. Like, yeah, but not really. Right. And uh, oh, you're the technology guys. Sometimes it's technology, right? Like they don't they want to be able to readily identify it so they can assign a budget and a number and a deliverable to it. And, you know, the ones that get it and do it well, you know, survive. So, um, but also I think that mechanic goes once it, once, once you draw the connection between experimentation and why it's important for your bottom line, then you become a little bit more vested in it. Right? I, I agree. At, at OMD, for instance, the ignition factory, which is the department I ran, it was started by the former CEO. So it was also like a top-down mandated uh -huh. kind of thing. He saw a need, you know, out of 10,000 employees around the world, there were 20 of us who were focused on this idea of innovation and spread across three offices. So it's, uh, and you know, it, so it didn't take much, right? If you do the math on, on that, I, I can't divide, but it's, it's like a small bit of your resources that go into like, let's, let's just see. Yes, that's right. Yeah, with, um, and you know, it's a small bit of resources. It's has very little downside and has a lot of potential upside. Right. So you are currently doing a lot of things. And the better you get and the more well known you are, the more opportunities you get to do other things. And so I'm curious what you're saying no to these days and how you're saying no. Or are you saying no? I should be saying more no. Cause I, I, you know, I'm the guy, like, I may sit down and have lunch with you. And next thing, like, I want to be a part of whatever it is you're doing. Cause I may have thrown out some, we riffed well together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know some resources that you should have and vice versa. Like, it's just, I get excited. I get, I'm easily excitable when it comes to those kinds of things. I, and you're used to hustling. Yeah, exactly. And it's a hard habit to break, right? Where it's, a, you know, I have a family. I got two kids, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like, I can't be everywhere I want to be. So I, I think even a, maybe a year or two ago, I kind of just like crafted my personal mission. And I think sticking to my guns on what that is, you know, which is really for me, I'm really spending 50% like of my time as a storyteller. I keep telling people it's sort of the Anthony Bourdain model. I started saying this when he was alive. Okay. But um, it's like half my time is spent as a storyteller taking you around the world and, you know, telling you these stories of innovation and their cultural relevancy, depending on where they are, mm -hmm. or who they are, or what they've created. And, um, and so this is so and this is in the form of your podcast talks, right. interviews, exactly. panels. Yeah. We're developing some TV stuff right now. And, okay. You know, any way I can uh, do that, right, okay. from a creative outlet. And then the other part is, you know, in order for me to maintain my relevancy as a storyteller in that arena, similar to Anthony Bourdain, he was still working in kitchens, still opening restaurants, still doing his craft. So I enjoy the craft just as much as I enjoy the storytelling. And I think they kind of go hand in hand. It allows me to be exposed to new things with a purpose, you know, and, and, and kind of build on that purpose. So I think as I, truly believe that these principles of innovation should be known and celebrated and looked at from many different angles and done it in a way that's palatable and fun and not like an NPR, you know, oh, we're here with the, <laughs> I, you know, and no, like I listen to NPR all the time, but you know, I feel like I have a brand that resonates well, mm -hmm. I hope. And so 
when I feel like something doesn't align fully with that mission. Like I have a friend who has a really great idea for a recruiting company. He just kind of turned that model on his head. Sure. I like, that sounds great. It's, there's only so much that I can do without derailing my own sort of. Cause it doesn't mission. fit. It sounds like you have three boxes, this personal, your family life, mm-hmm. telling stories and making things. Yeah. And doesn't fit into the making things bucket well enough to say yes exactly. to something well like enough that. is actually is key because even yeah. as i was saying and i'm like it's still innovation right like yeah and, yeah. That's, and that's the problem with the word is that it, yeah. it kind of it's ubiquitous right it can yeah the word is the word is a process right it's not it's not an, an industry in, an end product yeah right like it's and i think that's where most people focus is like on it's an end result as opposed to how you go about achieving an end result yeah that makes sense so, you know, in the world of comedy, I think no one really likes to admit this, but there's like this element of having a rival or an enemy or a frenemy, mm-hmm. you know, like there's other comics in your generation. You feel like you're competing. Oh, yeah. You're shaking your head. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So when you were a comic, did you have that experience? And now that you're not a refor- now that you're not a comic, do you feel like now that you're in this world of innovation, do you have a rival, a frenemy, an enemy? Someone you feel like you're competing I mean, you know, against. I talk about this idea of friendly competition and the, how it actually feeds ingenuity, right? The mm-hmm. fact that you did something that I thought was super cool and I go like, ooh, all right. Wait till, wait till you see what I do next. Uh-huh. No, nah, I won't shit on you. Like, I won't, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I think it happens all the time. I, I see things that I'm like, I wish I had done that. We all do. Like, I wish I had sure. done that. And if it's somebody you know or somebody, even somebody. Or an entity or whatever, like in your mind, you're on the same level as that person. Okay. You, maybe you're still in the process of getting there, but you know, like, I, give me, like, LeVar Burton was, the other day was like, oh, I could, I could beat Michael Jordan one on one. And then they, there's this video circulating of him throwing up seven bricks in a row. Yes. <laughs> so, but like in his head, he's like, give me one, give me one chance. And so I think that same sort of like I asked somebody the other day, was like, oh, so you're kind of like such and such. And I was like, I'm nothing. <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> you're like, I'm, I'm way better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that guy's got nothing on me. <laughs> and, and I was like, and I, you know, I found myself like, yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, what I do is, uh, you know, by, by the way, for the listeners, this is the most animated Chris has been. <laughs> He's like moving around in his seat right now and rubbing his head. Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Well, yesterday also this is yesterday is why it's, it's very fresh. I see. And yesterday was also my birthday, and not only was it my birthday, my son's birthday is on the eleventh. Okay, but we had his party on my birthday. Okay, so I was already like, "It's my birthday. <laughs> this is you're drinking my booze. Like, how dare you bring this gentleman up in front of me? Um, <laughs> it's like very mob boss of me. You come to my house and yeah. insult me, right?" Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I mean, it happens all the time. I, and I think it's, it's important yeah. to, to be that. Observer. By the way, I think you said LeVar Burton. Le, oh, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yes. Jordy LaForge was outside <laughs> shooting free throws. <laughs> LeVar Ball. Yes. LeVar Ball. Yes. Yes. Okay. I just, you, I don't know what LeVar I Burton still knew is. what you were talking about, but I was, yes. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like Jordy LaForge playing basketball. That's, that's, I think that's my I think I would do it. Sorry, I, it just popped into my head. So okay, so you, so the answer to my question is yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's yes, and you, but you see it largely as useful. Yeah, I mean, look, there's always, I, I, there's, I think there's a, a required self awareness to know what's the difference between like ah, I hate that or mm-hmm. uh, that's an indicator of actually what's possible. Yes, right. Back to my first writing job when I worked at BT. The guy who was a writer's assistant went on to create America's Next Top Model. Okay. Blackish. He wrote Girls Trip. He's mm. now directed and like a, he's, now he's moving into directing and, yeah, yeah. and Blackish is kind of based on his own life. It, it like at a point in time, I was, I go, he was my, like he was our department assistant, right? Yes. But at the same time, I go, like, that's, you know, somebody I still have a good really, I, I wasn't jealous per se. It was, I, it, I very easily could have, gone either way mm-hmm. with it, right had i not gone like oh there's a little bit of self-awareness and i think because you know from the entertainment industry it's such a subjective craft yeah whether you're a musician or you tap look whatever your thing is and even like 
business, your business creativity is still sort of subjective, right? You're putting something out into mm-hmm. the world and you go, I hope they like it. And, and the, re- sometimes the rejection, re- the rejection of that product is not necessarily a rejection of you, but you feel like it's a rejection of you. Yes. And I think that that happens all the time. That's why I think a lot of entertainers go into this weird space, right? Like, you know, all the issues with depression yeah. and that we've been here. You're hot. You're not. You're, you're only as good as your last movie. Exactly. Your last album. You yeah. Know, you're a fancy car, bus, fancy car. Yes. Like, that's not just a... The, you know, it's not as simple as that, right? The emotional part of it, the emotional journey is just as up and down. Yes. And so I think that's why, look, I think that's why there's so many like yoga studios and meditation clinics. Like there's, there's so much, there's a, there was a really good article in GQ a couple of months ago and it's like some writer said, I spent a month in LA doing every self help thing I could find and here's what happened. Right? I see. And so it, it's, it sounds like something to be on medium these days. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was pretty, it was a, it was an interesting read. But, um, you know, if you don't maintain that level of like separation from who you are, from what you do, yeah. um, it'll, it'll drive you crazy. Yeah. You know, I had, um, I have a very good therapist. And when I was working on the humor code, I, I didn't go, I actually didn't go to see him about professional problems. Um, but of course, you know, they come up, right? Yeah. It's therapy. And so he, he helped me really work on creating for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, so I was using, I wasn't using a rival per, well, and that's not true. It's a different form of a rival. I was, I was doing the I'll show them model of, um, hard work. Yeah. It's, it's, you know what it is? It's the Michael Jordan model of success. Yes. Right. Which is, you don't believe in me? I'll show you, you know? Yeah. And it works. You know, if you want to put in long hours, anger is a good way yeah. to do that. The problem with it, of course, is the no one ever goes, you know, Pete, I didn't think you were a very good lacrosse player when I met you, but you showed me through your hard work <laughs> and your pluck, you know, and uh, or I didn't really think you'd make it in this academic business, right. but you showed me. No one ever. It's like those Jerry Springer episodes when he was like, <laughs> you made fun of me in high school, but look at me now. And, and the, the person's like, like, you're still ugly. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like but I did all this work. I brought you to this television show just to prove to you. Right. And you know, and what it most of the time is they go, who are you? I don't, I'm not sure we've met before. Like the world is no one really cares about you, you know, in that sense. And so, um, I like, so I liked your framing of when you see someone else who's, who you feel like you have a little bit of a rivalry, friendship, frenemy ship with is that you go, wow, that can be done. That's inspiring and motivating. Versus, I need to prove, you know, yeah. to the world. And so I remember him, I remember him going, this is how naive I was. I remember saying, well, if I'm not going to use anger, how do I do it? Like, I didn't, I honestly didn't know the answer. I didn't know there was another way. I didn't know, you know, the Jordan method works. Yep. The, the problem, of and course, it's very public, right? It's a very publicized method. Yeah. And we, it, it, indeed, we know all those, you know, all yeah. those stories. That's right. Of course, it turns you into a bitter, I mean, you know, Jordan is just, you know, he he should be celebrating and happy man, and he's right. just a bitter, yeah, you know, churned up guy, absolutely, which is unfortunate. Um, and he and um, he said, you do it because you want to do a good job. So he basically was like, you do it for yourself. Yeah. You you make great things because you you believe it's important to make great things. Yeah. And and then as a result, you don't give over any power to anyone. And it, look, it all it all starts with you, you know, it, it, as a writer. And it, me, it, even if you have a writing partner, there's a, a point in time where you're in front of your computer by yourself. Yes. And your thoughts are coming out. Yes. It's it's no one else has thought of that at least yes. the way you have, right? And so, but but I think the further the more steps we take toward that thing coming to fruition, the more doubt shows up, the yeah. more the signals sometimes will show you the opposite of the direction you're headed, yes. you know, or the opposite direction you want to head in. And I, I mean, I like to think there's this like there's this journey where you go from idea and talent to you know, I guess let's call it showboating. For, for okay, the, sure. 
to purpose. Uh huh. Right. And, and, and it, it, like, even when I think about like what innovation means to me as far as a platform for storytelling for mm-hmm. like you know, what I've built with innovation crush and, and, and the book and all these things is like, I have to remind myself of the greater mission, which is I do want people to not feel like they're stuck in whatever thing they're in, mm-hmm. you know, the, whether it's you're trying to solve a business problem or it's personal. I, and so I, I keep reminding myself of that because I do see that person that was bought up yesterday at my, you know, my birthday is like, okay, but also see where they've done things really well and what I can learn from. And also go see what, like, what are the missing pieces? Yeah, I see. And where can I continue to fill a gap? And is the gap that I'm attempting to fill still a relevant gap? I see. And so then you just become a little bit more nimble and aware. So I want to ask you, this is, this might be related, I think. It's a question I, I, I've been puzzling over for a long time. So as a, you know, as a marketing professor, I regularly teach my students, you know, you identify a need in the marketplace and then you seek a solution for that need and then you test whether it actually is make, you know, solves the problem and, and so on, recognizing that there's competition and so on and so forth. In the world of the arts, entertainment and the arts, you get this notion of, um, you should make art for yourself, right? So you just, you should make art that makes you happy, that the art that you want to make, if you start trying to make art that makes other people happy, you're going to make bad art. Yep. Yeah. And so, so I, even though that conflicts with my advice to my students in some, in some way, one thing that I like about the idea is that if you're going to find something unique, that is one of a kind, it's likely to come from that make it for yourself process. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm in your experience. Have you come across this idea? Do you, what do you think of I, this happens, idea? I think it happens all the time. I, th- I, I think we forget how our taste it matters, right? Like the thing, our perspective or a taste, like if you're if, if going back to comedy, you, and you taught me this concept because I was like, I oh, taught you something? Yes. Well, one thing. <laughs> If, um, <laughs> cause I asked you, I, and I tell, I actually tell the story a lot. I asked you, I said, if three of us are in a room and two of us are cracking up and one person's like, uh, I don't get you, it. Right. And you said, it's not that it's not funny. It's not funny to me. Yes. Like, that's the proper phrasing. Um, in fact, I actually taught my daughter that she, she does it to me. All the time. She's like, that's not funny to, <laughs> to me. me. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, th- and I'm flattered by that, by the way. Oh, no, yeah. They, no, I, I, I genuinely mean that. Yeah. So thank you. Because it's, is that re- as a writer, comedy per- person's rooted there, I crack myself up a lot, like annoyingly so <laughs> to my wife and, and like, to the people at JPL. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and to the people at JPL. But, uh, you know, but I, I'd like to think that there are more of me. Right, like, yeah. I'd like I'd like to think that it's a big world, nine yeah, billion people. Exactly, I'd like to think if I did that garbage can stuff, <laughs> and there were more people with us, a couple because uh, two people joined in. Don't forget, like, two people, <laughs> they started going. Oh, there's a space tree. <laughs> like it was, and and then you can see people who are visibly annoyed, which then again makes it even funnier. Yeah, and I think the same thing happens in business. You talk to most entrepreneurs. They go, there's something in their DNA about whatever it is they've created. One of my favorite examples is I had a chance to interview Miguel McKelvey, the CEO and founder of uh, WeWork. Okay. It's not the I, only I think one. I listened to the How I Built This with that guy. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I haven't listened to that one, but... I, I, well, you don't need to. You've interviewed him. It's true. It's true. I don't have to, <laughs> don't have to listen to podcasts. I listened to this one, though, just, just so you know. No, but he, you know, come to find out, he grew up in communal style living, right? Yes. His mom and her two best friends had five kids amongst them. They shared everything and got rides to school. And it's rooted in what we work is. Yes, you that's know? a good point. So where there's other shared workspaces, and, and you know, I'll give you one last example is, uh, Tristan Walker, who was like the, I don't know, the number 11 hire at Twitter and then, uh, was the number four hire at Foursquare and, I was like, how did you know to make a leap from, you know, from Twitter, which was obviously, thank you to President Trump, that is, it's back up and running to, to this brand new thing. He goes, I go, he said, it was convenient to me. Ah. It was something I would have used. That was his only barometer. I see. Right. So, and then you can start to do the, the diligence behind it from a business standpoint. Sure, sure. But you go like, 
Would I use it? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then that, and in many instances, that's good enough. Nice. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, as someone who's, I'm trying to find more time to create. Yeah. You know, I, I here's the thing that I don't think the average person understands is how hard creating is, but with practice, it becomes even more reward. The process becomes yes. rewarding, not just the outcome. And now I feel like I'm a good solid 10 years into being serious yeah. about being a creative person. And I like it more than ever. And I like the process more than ever. And I'm just trying to find more and more time and space and energy yeah. to do it. And I'm starting to kind of kick around even more seriously about like, what am I going to try to make that I'm just doing completely for myself? Right. No, that's great. I, it's, and I don't know if there's more people in the world like you or more people in the world like me, but I don't know, but it doesn't matter. How many of them there I think are, I, would, I think. I, I would like to think that most of us are that way. Most of us have less time than we have ideas, right? And so how do you navigate that difference? I, I feel like I have so much I want to get done before I die. Oh, yeah. Well, it was it Wayne Dyer says, don't die with the music still in you. So get to... get to, get to Wait, who says that? Who? Wayne Dyer. Who is Wayne Dyer? I, I uh, he's like a, he's like a producer. Uh, no, he's like oh. a Deepak Chopra. He's like you, you know. Oh, I see. Um, okay. uh, I thought it was a mu- musical person talking swami about it. Kind of, <laughs> kind of got it. Got it. Got um, it. But yeah, so he gave all these talks, and you know, Tony Robbins, Deepak, like a yeah, yeah. crew of individuals. Hey, house. One of the things I talk about in the book was by just starting the process and at least committing to some percentage of your time or effort or energy into creating that thing it's I, I said it's counterintuitive but for a while my my like prayer or wish or whatever was mm-hmm. for more capacity yes and if see. you think about like when you learn how to drive a car it's it's a very you gotta the car has to be in the right gear mirrors adjusted 10 and 2 on the steering wheel uh and then you know a year later you got a cheeseburger in your hand <laughs> you're on the phone like you're not looking where you go i saw that old lady she's fine like <laughs> And it, driving becomes easier. Now you can do more tasks while you drive. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I think it's the same thing if, by just getting in the habit of practicing a little bit on working on one of those yeah. ideas or one of those things. Or, hey, every third Saturday, I'm taking I'm, from 9 to 12, I'm just sitting in Starbucks and doing some legwork. Yes. Whatever that first step is. You t- and then it becomes easier. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and also, I, I think... I tried to do something where, even with Innovation Crush, I painted myself into a corner with it because I knew, you know, there's a, that potential of starting something and then leaving it alone. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so. My first day, I did five interviews back to back. Okay. So, you know, book studio for whatever, f- five, six hours. And then I was doing a weekly show. So I, that gave me five weeks worth of wiggle room. If I put out five episodes, I probably should, you know, I, now I feel like there's an expectation for me to do more. Yes. Um, it also gave me time to adjust because I, each one, I would publish one every week. Mm-hmm. Which is the easy part. But I, I did enough that I felt like I was obligated to continue. I to see. Do it. So, cause I very easily could have been like, Oh, this is a good name for a podcast. I'm going to do it one day. Yeah. Right. I, um, I committed to do a hundred. Yeah, see? That was my, that was, I said, I'm going to do 100 and then I'm going to reassess. Yeah. I had like 25 in the can before I started to launch. Yeah. And, um, but only because someone told me you should have like 20 in the can before Absolutely. you launch. I think, it, it, and, but I think even your mechanic is different but complementary to mine, right? Which you, you started off with a number and said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not like, I don't work that way. I see. If I say I'm going to do 20 or something or like, I don't know if I'll, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, I but I will do as much as I can to paint myself yeah. into that corner. Um, cause your promise is to yourself, right? Like, it is. Yes. And mine was very public. I needed to have something where it was like, okay, I call it my ego or whatever. It's like, now I have to finish it. I see. Especially once I got the feedback and I saw that it was actually working. You know, yeah. People, as, you're as providing people. value to people. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, this podcast is my closest thing to an audience of one. Like it's the it's the podcast I wanted to do, right? And so um, I pick the guests that I want and stuff like that. I mean, I think except for people. Me. No, no, I was I was excited. <laughs> uh, Chris is calling me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you made it easy, which I appreciate. <laughs> but um, 
but I yeah you de- you I made my LA list and you were you were on it so well, and here we are. Um, last question. Yes. What are you reading, watching, or listening to that's really good that stands out, even great? I'm this is, this is very fresh and I'm late and this is kind of like my birthday, my weird birthday gift to myself was I finished Breaking Bad. Is that right? I started it in November. Okay. I know I'm super late to the game. So now I'm like, I'm having that lonely experience. Where you're like, <laughs> you have no and, then, and then Walt, remember he shot the one guy and people were like, could you beat it please? That's like 10 years ago now. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was 2011 when I was okay. looking at the dates and then I think it ended in 2015 maybe. Oh, so it's not that late. Okay. All right. Still though, like for yeah. the amount of content that's And you watched content. the whole thing. Yeah. I watched okay. it uh, from November to the to January 5th. I, I see. I finished it. But so, so the good news about that, no one has said breaking bad to the answer see? to that question. So that's excellent. Um what was a what was a peculiar answer that you had gotten? What is a peculiar one? Yes. Oh I you know, I don't know. I mean <laughs> I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. I don't I mean you know, it's um so the most common answer is Rick and Morty. Ah. Yeah. And Sapiens is starting to come up a lot. Okay. As book and then and and thing and then after that, it's it runs the gamut. I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. Breaking Bad, it was it was great to watch this evolution. And at the you know he'd been saying this whole time, you're like I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for my family. Mm-hmm. And all this, you know, if you've seen the show, you like know all the. Crazy I, I made it. I did two seasons. Yeah. I didn't see the end. So you know, like he, so he yeah. made drugs and whatever comes with the drug, he killed eleven people in prison in two minutes. Like it was just all sorts of crazy. <laughs> And then when he like he goes into hiding and he comes out and he goes to visit his wife and he's like, he's like, you know, I, you know, or something like you, I did this. And she was like, for don't, you. She, no, she goes, don't give me that cockamamie stuff about you did this for you. He's like, I did it for me. And he was like, I was good at it. And he goes, and, ah. it. and you know, it, he's like, I felt alive. And it's, it, it's just, it's an interesting, I think, a character shift that we all go through. It's like you're doing something for vocally what you're, the reason you're saying you're doing it mm-hmm. might not be as accurate as why you're actually doing it. I see. You know, it could be like, oh, we can make a lot of money or like we can, whatever the surface goal is, there's some depth. And then when he starts saying like he felt alive and it was something that he was good at and because he was a high school chemistry teacher who yes. founded a billion dollar company, but exited on his own. So he had some life regrets and things that he was working through. And it's interesting also to see it all in succession, right? As opposed to you once know, a week over, over five years, years yes. right? I saw it all in six weeks. Uh-huh. <laughs> so... Uh, so everything was very fresh in terms of the peaks and valleys of his experience. And, uh, you know, and I think any good piece of entertainment, like there's a reflection of you in it, mm-hmm. you know, whether the reluctant hero was another, you know, you know kind of meme in, in writing. Right? Yes. It's like, oh, not me. It's any good Arthur. hero is a reluctant hero. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. so no, that, that's it. but on the more, I don't know, serious side, I read the, I read a lot of like, philosophical kind of books Mm -hmm. um i read this paulo coelho book right is that his name uh called letters from Accra. okay and it's basically this town near babylon is about to be destroyed invaded by some soldiers and they all gather around this stranger who has come you know been living there for the last 20 years or whatever and kind of took up a humble job but they know he's wise and he's seen the world and so they start asking him all these questions you would probably ask if you're about to die. And, you know, what about love? What about this? And one of the things that resonated most. So every chapter, somebody asks a question and he answers it very poetically. I see. And so one of them was like, talk to us about death. And he's like, you know, most people say live every day like it's your last. He's like, I prefer to live every day like it's my first where everything is full of wonder. Mm. You know, I like. Uh, there's a sense of wonder everywhere I go. And he, the example he used like that shirt. He's like, think about the water that ran through the rivers on the, and grew the cotton, the person that picked it, pre slavery, um, the person, <laughs> <laughs> the person that picked it. And then, you know, the, and, and through all that process, it's landed on you and it's the perfect fit for you. And it, it's yours. I see. Right. Um, and it's kind of like, Having this sense of depth and just like realizing like, hey, this water bottle isn't just a water bottle. Like mm-hmm. it's in some cases saving life. Like, you know, there's some there's some other levels to it. So yeah, that's that's that was my, my book choice. No, that's fun. That's great. 
Chris, I really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate this, you doing it. This was super fun. Yeah. I knew it would be. You know what I did? I went back and listened to our podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Hardy Har Boys yeah. <laughs> is <laughs> what you called that it. That was one of my favorite puns, by the way. <laughs> The Hardy Har Boys, because you guys were de- humor detectives. Indeed. It was great. Which is how we started out. Forensics, detectives. Uh, look at Full you circle. bringing it all around. <laughs> um, this is great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit PeterMcGraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation on I'm Not Joking. Yeah.